Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 12 of the OpenStax Psychology Textbook. My name is Matthew Poole and I'm going to be going over social psychology with you today. So whenever it comes to social psychology, social psychology deals with all kinds of interactions between people spanning a wide range of how we connect from moments of confrontation to moments of working together and helping others. So social psychologists believe that an individual's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are influenced by social situations. So whenever it comes to social psychology, we're really looking at how the individual is influenced by their environment and the social situations. Um, that they are operating within. Now, social psychology can be also broken down into two topics, intrapersonal topics as well as interpersonal topics. So whenever it comes to intrapersonal, this is regarding yourself, your emotions, attitudes, and social cognition. When it comes to interpersonal topics, this is between people. Okay, so this includes helping behavior, aggression, prejudice, and discrimination, attraction and close relationships, and group processes and intergroup relationships. Now, when it comes to situationism versus dispositionism, situationism is the view that our behavior and actions are determined by our immediate environment and surroundings. This is what's used by social psychologists. Now when it comes to one's disposition, this is the view that our behavior is determined by internal factors, a tribute of a person such as personality traits and temperament. This is favored in the United States by personality psychologists. So situationism is uh, regarding how the uh, situation influences and that predominantly your behavior and actions are determined by your environment whereas your disposition whereas disp excuse me dispositionism is due to who you are is how you behave now when it comes to the fundamental attribution error the fundamental attribution error, and this is an important topic to make sure to write down and jot down if you're taking this for a class, is the tendency to overemphasize internal factors as explanations slash attributions for the behavior of other people and underestimate the power of the situation. So, have you ever been in a situation where, and I'm sure you have, if you've been dry, if you've driven for at least like a month before, and somebody is speeding past you and they either cut you off or you're driving down the road and somebody pulls out in front of you. What are you likely to say next or at least think next? I can probably guess is that it's not going to be something nice, right? And so we as humans may fall victim to the fundamental attribution error where we overemphasize internal factors about people. We say that they're pulling out in front of us or driving erratically because they're inherently a jerk. But what we don't do in that moment, like I said, we overemphasize uh, the internal about somebody and we underestimate underestimate the power of the situation they may be they may be going through so let me reframe that for them for you now what if you uh, were able to realize what was going on in the situation maybe that person was speeding to the hospital to see a loved one or maybe their partner was in labor and they're trying to get to the hospital how does that view your feelings now do you kind of feel bad about yourself? That's okay. We all do this from time to time where we overemphasize internal factors about pe people to, uh, as an explanation for their behavior rather than taking a second to think about the uh, situation that they may, they may be going through. So now we have a little bit more sympathy, of course, now that we know that that person is headed to the hospital uh, to see a loved one. But maybe they could drive a little bit safer. I don't know. Either way, so moving forward, we've got the self-serving bias. So this is kind of like the opposite of the fundamental attribution error. So the self-serving bias is our tendency uh, to take credit by making dispositional or internal attributions for positive outcomes, but whenever situ but situational or external attributions for negative outcomes. So whenever something good happens to us, of course we're likely to you know boast ourselves up say oh it's because I'm that good like when a football player catches a touchdown pass and um, whenever they go into the end zone they're running around the place they like outstretch their arms with the football and they're like look at me look at me you know look how good I am but then in that same football game uh, whenever the receiver uh, either trips up over themselves or they drop a pass whatever the case is and they fall to the ground what may happen next on occasion. We've picked up on this and we understand that <clears throat> you know these people are, are faking it from time to time, but they'll get up and they'll kind of hobble a little bit. They'll fake an injury because 
they didn't want to, they may just have tripped and they embarrassed themselves. And so they're trying to attribute the negative outcome to something that is external. Well, there's a divot in the grass or it was due to uh, an injury. I couldn't have controlled my injury. You know, if I got hurt, then, you know, it's not due to me. It's due to something that I, outside of myself that I couldn't control. Okay. Now let's talk about the just world hypothesis. So again, this is just a hypothesis. This is not a law of science um, or anything like that. So please take this with a, gra with a grain of salt. Uh, remember, a hypothesis is an educated guess. But there is a just world hypothesis that states that some people believe that they get the outcomes that they deserve in life. So um, if you do good, you eventually will end up getting good. And if you do bad, it may not be immediate, but eventually that bad um that bad juju, for lack of better terms, may come back to you. All right. And so what do you think? Do you think that the world is ultimately a just place? I know that we all know that just because whenever you do something bad, it may not come back to bite you immediately. But do you think that eventually it comes back to get you in the long run? Let me know in the comments how you feel about the just world hypothesis. All right, let's talk about self-presentation, including topics such as social roles, uh, social norms, scripts, as well as Philip Zimbardo and the Stanford Prison Experiment. So when it comes to one's social role, this is a pattern of behavior that is expected of a person in a given, given setting or group, such as we all have different roles that we, uh, and different hats that we put on in certain situations. So Right now, if you're a student in my class, you have your student hat on, and there are certain expectations that you have as a student, but you have different expectations if you're a father, or if you're a teacher, if you are a fast food worker, whatever the case is, we all have identity roles that we um, attribute our life to, and we act in a way that is expected of us in that given situation. So I'm not going to interact with my students in a classroom because I'm not, I've I've got my teacher hat on the same way that I would interact with my friends, right? So in that role, I'm a friend. In the classroom, I'm a teacher. So I'm going to act in a way that's uh, expected of me as a result of that. Okay, so social norms. So a group's expectation of what is appropriate and acceptable behavior for its members. So if you as ascribe to or establish yourself to a particular uh, group or setting, there are going to be situations where, or there's going to be uh, expectations that are expected of you. I hate to use that those two words back to back, but there are going to be some things that are expected of you for what's appropriate behavior. So when you're in that group, how are you supposed to behave and think? What are we expected to talk about? What are we expected to wear? So this can be in, you know, in your sp specific friend group. This can be in church. This can be in uh, a number of different settings in which you ascribe to a group um, and a fan of a particular team, things like that. So whenever it comes to a script, this is a person's knowledge about the sequence of events expected um, in a specific setting. So when it comes to this, you know, whenever you go to a fast food restaurant versus a nicer restaurant, you know the difference between the two. Because of, of your schemas that you've been able to pick up, you have a social script that you can go back into your file and cabinet, pull out and be like, oh, okay, when I go to a fast food restaurant, I order at the counter, right? And then, when, but whenever you're at a, a, a nicer restaurant, if you were to go up to them and start ordering at the hostess table, um, they would look at you like you're crazy, right? And so I know that's very elementary and simple, but it's a, it's a good way to introduce you into how scripts are and how if we don't have particular scripts or understandings of how we're supposed to operate in, in specific social settings, then we just are going around acting whatever way and it's not appropriate. Uh, it, there's no organization that works, right? Okay, so we're going to talk about the Philip Zimbardo experiment known as the Stanford Prison Experiment in 1971. So this experiment is considered pretty unethical for obvious reasons, but it did give us a good bit of insight into uh, some into social norms as well as scripts. So to give you a little bit of background, 
whenever it comes to the Stanford prison experiment, this happened at Stanford University in the basement of the psychology department. They recruited males who were randomly assigned to either the role of a prisoner or a guard. Okay, and so whenever they were assigned, the experiment was supposed to go on for at least two weeks. But because things became so uh, abusive and uh, things got out of control, the pr the prisoners were acting out erratically. They experienced mental breakdowns as a result of the torment from the uh, the guards, and so the experiment only lasted six days. And I think that that is wise for the experimenter, Dr. Zimbardo, to do, to just call it quits on the experiment. He should have had a, maybe, and this is, of course, being a, 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 a armchair quarterback in this situation, but I, I think a little bit of foresight would have, could have told you what could what would have happened in this experiment. And there's a video, you probably can't click on it through this YouTube video, but if you just type in on YouTube, Stand for Prison Experiment, there's actual footage of this of this study that you can go back and look for yourself. There's also dramatizations, uh, movies that have been made about the Stanford Prison Experiment, I think, for free online. So if you want to see a dramatized version of it, take it with a grain of salt because it's not exactly uh, like the experiment was they get pretty close but it's dramatized into a movie for a reason to make it more theatrical so i want you to go into it with a grain of salt if you want to see the actual footage you can do so but if, as well as if you want a dramatized version of it you can watch the movie on it on online Okay, moving forward to attitudes and persuasion let's talk about cognitive dissonance and persuasion these are two very very important topics so when it comes to cognitive dissonance, this is whenever you have psychological discomfort as a result of two or more incongruent or inconsistent beliefs, attitudes, or behaviors. Okay. Now, when it comes to this, usually what I'll see for people who experience cognitive dissonance is that there's an incongruence between a belief that they have as well as a behavior. And so there are a few ways in which we can alleviate this cognitive dissonance. So firstly being, you just change the behavior, right? Uh, easier said than done, especially when it comes to addiction. But you can also change, the secondly, you can also change the belief about it. Well, the harms and the risk of smoking are inconclusive. You know, my grandfather smoked till he was 90 years old or whatever the case is, and I've got his genes, so I should be just fine. So you're changing either the belief or you quit the smoking altogether if smoking is the cognitive dissonance that you're experiencing. You have the belief that you probably shouldn't smoke, but you still engage in the behavior of doing so. All right. So this right here is, again, just to give you more so a visual version of that very example of smoking. And you can add any sort of addiction because addiction in this for this example is pretty low hanging fruit and easy to describe whenever it comes to this particular topic. A lot of people know that they probably shouldn't abuse the, the substance that they are, but they still engage in the behavior because of a psychological or even physical addiction to it. And so the way that you can alleviate that mental discomfort, again, either changing, stopping smoking, stopping drinking, stopping taking drugs, again, easier said than done, or change the belief about uh, the particular substance. Well, it helps me perform better. It helps me, you know, be more productive, whatever the case is. And we talked about that defense mechanism in previous chapters, uh, in, their, in the last one, with chapter 11, personality. So go check that out if you haven't already and learn more about defense mechanisms. And that one is called rationalization. Okay, let's talk about persuasion. We're all getting persuaded every single day, whether we like to admit it or not. There's so many subtle things. It doesn't have to just be a billboard smack dab in our face. It can be subtleties that we may not even necessarily notice that can also influence us. So to give persuasion a definition, it is the process of changing our attitude towards something based on some kind of communication. So it can be verbal, it can be written, it can be visual, uh, whatever the case is. Uh, it, as long as it's able to be communicated. And so we constantly are being inundated with, you can see right here, especially on this, 
uh, Honda here. Somebody is wanting to persuade you by and hoping that by you passing by and glancing at their car sticker that it'll somehow change your behavior for whatever way. Okay, but although that may not be the best way to persuade somebody, there are techniques that are a lot better. And when you understand a lot of techniques in persuasion, you can utilize these in your own life. And one of these techniques is called the foot in the door technique. This is when a persuader gets a person to agree to a small favor only to re later request a larger favor. So in this essence, you know you want something bigger in the long term. But if you ask it up front, you're likely to get a no. But something about humans uh, that you need to understand is that we like to be consistent people. Whenever we say yes to something, we tend to... Uh, want to keep with that trajectory and what I mean by that is and it's not in all cases but it's again a higher likelihood that you can get the achieve the desired result in the end where if you go up to somebody say you're running for some campaign for whatever you're wanting to get and you go up to the person you say hey um, uh, appreciate you taking this time. Can you? I'm running for a campaign for whatever office. I've got this sign here. Do you care if I just set it in your yard? Low effort doesn't really, you know, you don't really have to work at it or anything like that. They just pop it in the yard and they go. You're not really doing anything. Now, next they may come to you and say, hey, really appreciate the support so far. I've got these buttons that I made and I would like to just give you one for free. Do you care to maybe wear this around town? And although you don't really see that happen often, it is just a very elementary example to show you how that progression can continue to increase in, um, in size or requests. So, with the button, it takes a little bit more effort. You actually have to pin it. You have to wear it around. You come home and you take it off, things like that. Um, then you come back to that person. You say, hey, really appreciate the uh, ongoing support that you've had for me. Um, I've got this campaign event that I'm trying to get volunteers for. I appreciate uh, you helping me out so far. Is there any way you can make this from like one to two to assist with people checking in? Right. And so according to the foot in the door technique, if it and this I know that's a very quick one, two, three, it can occur usually over the over the course of multiple requests. But in this essence, you would have a higher likelihood of getting that person to um, volunteer for your event than you would if you just showed up one day and say, hey, uh, help me out with this thing. It's just like, OK, dude, I don't even know who, who you are. But once you've established some sort of. Uh, oh, the word's not coming to me. But once you've established some sort of, not camaraderie, but some basis with this person, some sort of emotion and, and, and companionship or acquaintance, uh, you've established being an acquaintance with this person, there's uh, a lot higher likelihood they're, they're, they'll help you out with your event. Okay. Moving forward, let's talk about conformity, compliance, and obedience. So when it comes to conformity, we've talked about this in previous chapters with Solomon Ash. So Ash showed us that we are more likely to conform to a group and go along with people's um, the overall group's decision, even if we don't inherently agree with it ourselves. So how he demonstrated this experiment is through it, he what he did was he recruited a series of individuals who were a part of the study or they understood what was going on. And so whenever they would bring the participant in that was being actually studied, they had no idea what was going on. What the group had decided to do is whenever they were shown the figure on the left, they would pick an image or a line on the right that was incongruent with X. So in this essence, they would say like A is equal to X. And so what uh, Ash showed us was that the individuals felt pressured in that moment to conform because the majority went in a different direction than he did. So he would, the, or she would go, would also say A is congruent with line X, even though it's very clear that uh, X is congruent with C. All right. Now we've got motivation to conform in, uh, in, to, to go a little bit more into depth with this. This is normative social influence and informational social influence. When it comes to normative social influence, people conform to the group 
uh, to fit in, to feel good, and be accepted by the group. It's not because they have the right information. And so that's what Ash showed us is normative social influence. When it comes to informational social influence, this is whenever people conform because they actually believe the group is competent and they have the right answers or correct information with whatever task or situation is at hand. Okay? Moving forward, we've got Stanley Milgram's obedience experiment. When it comes to Milgram's obedience experiment, he showed us that we are more likely to obey an individual if they appear like they are in some sort of authority or superiority. In this study, he recruited individuals to be teachers and students, and they would be quote-unquote randomly chosen to either be that teacher or student, but in all actuality, the person who is being studied is, was always going to be the teacher. The student is a confederate or somebody who is a part of the study. Whenever they were doing the study, Milgram was in the room with the teacher. On the other side was the student. And the teacher would ask a series of questions. Whenever the, teacher, whenever the student would get the answers correct, there was no penalty, but whenever they answered it incorrectly, they would receive a shock. And each time that the answer was wrong, the shocks increased in intensity all the way up to 450 volts, which is obviously uh, like you'll die. And so um, what he noticed was that two out of the three participants continued to administer shocks to an unresponsive learner. Okay. And so you will see throughout the footage, if you look it up on YouTube, that whenever the teacher would try and push back on the experimenter, the experimenter would say, no, whatever happens here, it's all on me. It's not on you. If something bad happens, I've got this, but the study must continue. And so the, te the teacher or the somebody or the person who's being experimented on would continue to go uh, on with the study but they were obviously very uncomfortable but the thing is is they still went on and they obeyed the commands of an authority figure so it just makes you really think about uh day-to-day -day life and how much we listen to people because they um you know are in authority or seem like they're the superior figure okay Social facilitation and social loafing. Whenever it comes to social facilitation, this is whenever an individual's capabilities are enhanced because an audience is watching them. So I noticed this whenever I was in high school. I used to kick for my high school football team. And whenever I was in practice, I could kick a decent distance, but it was never as far as I it would go in a game. And I always got confused by that. And it was quite simple. The audience or the fans in the stands, they, whenever I knew that, because I knew that they were watching me, somehow my performance was enhanced. I was able to perform better. I kicked the ball a lot further. There was some sort of extra motivation that I got. Now, whenever it comes to, um, if you're not as skilled at a particular task, an audience can actually hinder your performance. And we kind of talked about similar um, similar terms in previous chapters, but it remains true throughout. It remains a similar uh, notion that whenever you are super nervous as a result of too many people or are in a highly anxious situation and you're not as skilled at a task or it's not a simple task, your performance can be compromised. Now, when it comes to social loafing, this is the exertion of less effort by a person working together with a group. We all have experienced this at some point, either at school or at work, where whenever we do some sort of group work all together, um, there seems to always be at least one, two, or maybe even more people, depending on the size of the group, that exert significantly less energy than the rest. All right, And that's what's known as social loafing. So you've always experienced it, but you may not have been able to put a term to it. Now, when it comes to in-groups and out-groups, a group that we identify with or see ourselves as belonging to is considered our in-group. 
our out groups are groups that we view as fundamentally different from us. And so whenever we are within our in group, there may be some sort of bias. And this is what's known as a either prejudice and or discrimination because the out group is perceived as different and is less preferred than our in groups. Okay. Now, we've got the bystander effect. So the bystander effect, is, and you've probably at least heard of it in passing before, is the phenomenon which a witness slash bystander does not volunteer to help a victim or person in distress. So why would that occur? It's because whenever there's a mass group around us, we tend to go along with what everybody else is doing, but also there's a what's known as a diffusion of responsibility. This is the tendency for no one in a group to help because the responsibility ability to help is spread throughout right whenever it's a very close situation it's pretty easy to determine who's going to help who's going to do what but whenever there's a mass group there's this diffusion of responsibility throughout the crowd okay we're going to end on talking about pro-social behavior so this will include altruism forming relationships and attraction so when it comes to pro-social behavior and altruism, this is the, when it comes to pro-social behavior, the voluntary behavior with the intent to help other people. Now, altruism is people's desire to help others even if the costs outweigh the benefits of helping. So this is literally helping people without any sort of ulterior motive in mind and just wanting to help people for the good of helping people, not in expectation of receiving something. And this can lead, and this is because of something called empathy. We've talked about this throughout the class, but empathy is the ability to take the perspective of other people, okay, and and put yourselves in the shoes of them. So that's the difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for somebody. Empathy is actually being able to put yourselves in the shoes of others and understand what they are feeling. When it comes to reforming relationship, there's no question why. Um, we and how we form the relationships that we do with technology we've been able to expand our ability to meet other people and form friendships so technology is in a way you know although there's some difficulties that come with technology at least in certain ways we've been able to meet people that we probably wouldn't have been able to otherwise if we didn't have this capability to reach anybody in the world but Speaking from a world without technology, proximity, of course, is going to be the number one of the number one and top ways in which you form relationships, be they partnerships or uh, romantic relationships or friendships is what I'm trying to say. And so proximity includes the people whom you have the most contact with and similarity, people who are similar to us in backgrounds, attitude, and lifestyle. And what's important for these relationships to continue to uh, go deeper and, and feel um, more enriched is through reciprocity as well as self-disclosure. If you want to go beyond the surface level and actually have meaningful relationships, you're going to have to tell that person information about yourself, self-disclosure. So it's sharing uh, personal information and reciprocity. That's hugely important in relationships. Now, it's all, not always going to be equal in every single friendship, but there needs to be some sort of give and take to where individuals each receive some sort of benefit in return for uh, the friendship or relationship. Now, there are a number of ways that we are attracted to other people, uh, be they physical, emotional, more abstract. And it's not a one-size-fits-all situation. Now, your textbook uh, in OpenStax College tends to highlight some features that are more so considered uh, universally attractive. And for... Uh, cis men who are attracted to cis women who identify with their... Uh, gender, they identify these universally attractive features for, for women, from men, from men to women. Large eyes, high cheekbones, a narrow jawline, a slender build, and a lower waist-to-hip ratio. When it comes to social traits, this includes warmth, affection, and social skills. So from cis women to cis men who identify with their gender, 
Uh, physically speaking, this include tall men who are tall, have broad shoulders and a narrow waist, and social traits of achievement, leadership qualities, ability to lead a family, and job skills. And so there is this hypothesis uh, under this category that states that people tend to pick somebody they view as their equal in physical attractiveness as well as social desirability. Okay, do you agree with that hypothesis? Let me know in the comments. So that is going to end chapter 12 of the OpenStack Psychology textbook. I will see you in the next one and hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.